The following conversation is with Roberto Mesa and Dave Demling, both of the creators of East Denver Food Hub. And this is a conversation that uh, I, I knew was going to be good going in. I didn't realize how good it was going to be based on the, the topics that we covered. So Dave and Roberto are both first-generation farmers. They are longtime friends. They came together in Denver, Colorado to create first a, a farm, a working farm, um, established a passive solar greenhouse on their land, created the East Denver Food Hub for distribution across their, their market, and most recently a creation of the East Denver Media Hub to incorporate a lot more storytelling of producers and uh, other other food initiative projects across the region. So I'm Don Davidson. This is the Regenerative Agriculture Club podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Roberto Mesa and Dave Demling with East Denver Food Hub. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast, Regenerative Agriculture Club here. I always have a, a, a tremendous amount of, of wonderful guests on the podcast, uh, but there are a few that when I know going into the interview, I know that it's going to be really something special. And I know this is exactly what the, this conversation is going to be, uh, because joining me are, are uh, two people that I've um, got to know over the past couple of months and with what they've built in a, with what I would consider a social enterprise. It's uh, Roberto Meza and Dave Demling with East Denver Food Hub. Dave, Roberto, thanks for hanging here, guys. Hi, Don. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Don. Yeah. So I thought a good way to start this, because, I, Roberto, I remember this in one of our initial conversations, is just kind of the origin story of how you and Dave came together in Denver and how this whole thing got started for you guys. Yeah. Um, so Dave and I are old high school friends. That really is where the story begins. That's where we met in Ohio, and we were both um, participating in a video productions kind of vocational program. Uh, we both had a desire to pursue video and film, and um, we really clicked and realized we worked well together on those projects uh, for school. And um, then we kind of split ways. Dave went to the West Coast to pursue his career in, in media, and I went to the East Coast. And um, through serendipitous ways, uh, we found ourselves back in Ohio after our higher educational careers, and we crossed paths again on a farm this time. <laughs> in Ohio? In Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was, I was working on a biodynamic uh, hydroponics farm in the middle of um, basically an Amish community, and Dave, coincidentally, was taking a workshop at Crop King Greenhouses right down the street, and so... Um, you know, we realized that uh, we were now shifting gears and extremely interested in growing food and farming and all of the wonderful things that that can bring to people. Yeah, so. I mean, yeah, we just figured out that we worked, still worked well together because we knew we were good humans. So you know, kinda, <laughs> it's a good start, right? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a finite basis, right? And yeah. Then, uh, we kind of worked from there and uh, we slowly built up Emerald Gardens. Uh, we got the land around 2013 once we moved to Colorado. Uh, it, we really just uh, slowly built it from, we put the barn up, we got the well, we got the electricity. We started growing greens outside, wor working with the land, trying to figure out what was best with what we were doing, trying to do a more biodynamic farming type of thing and really uh eventually we started growing microgreens because we had the ability mm -hmm. and that really started emerald gardens on let him explain yeah. where we started it at because it yeah was, we you know we realized that this you know walking onto the land here it's 35 acres on the eastern plains right outside of denver 15 minutes from denver international airport i mean we didn't know where to start <laughs> We come up to this expansive space of land and, you know, the first thing we had to do was stick the, the, the corner of the barn and that literally oriented everything that is, um, is now developing. So in that, in that amount of time, you know, we, we realized we still wanted to engage and start growing. You know, we couldn't wait for the farm to be perfect in order to start growing. So um, I started growing microgreens at um, a location in Broomfield that I was renting at the time in 2017. And slowly, you know, we, we developed and um, began the learning curve of developing the business. 
And so I started engaging with um, people at the farmer's market, with shops and restaurants, with grocery stores. And uh, it was a little bit of, of um, definitely a mix of hubris and ambition to <laughs> just see what happens and throwing stuff out there to see what sticks. And, um, you know, we were grateful to have a good, solid start. Eventually, uh, you know, Dave and I talked and we we're like, look, if we're really going to do this, let's let's do it. And let's start moving things out to the farm. We didn't have power yet. We, we didn't have like the infrastructure set up. But, uh, you know, Dave figured out amazing like ways to solve some of these challenges. And we got a shipping container. We retrofitted it. We started running solar panels and generators kind of off grid. And we were able to transition the business, uh, retaining our wholesale and our retail customer base. Really with that, those connections, yeah. Roberto was building up all throughout that time. And that really is how like we could, you know, come out to the farm and like we we're sustaining those accounts and mm -hmm. growing more and more. So each little step, like as soon as we got out here, the shipping container wasn't big enough. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, the side of the shipping container, the greenhouse that we built on the side of the shipping container wasn't big enough. And then we yeah. moved into a bigger greenhouse while we were waiting for this to be built. Yeah. And we just kept out growing spaces and learning so much about controlled environment, what that means, and then contextualizing that within the greater acreage of the farm and trying to understand, you know, hey, we want to be good stewards of our, our soil and our land. You know, we understand this is a, an amazing opportunity that not a lot of people get who want to start farming. And we took it as a, a blessing, as a vocation to really steward it into a direction that fulfills our purpose, that is able to feed our community and to learn from it continuously. Really, since we, we know we have this land and we've been trying to the entire time is share the ability to have land. So, yeah. I mean, we've been working with several different farm partners or community organizations and kind of, uh, you know, doing some sort of farming project. Sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes they work out. But it's great to be able to have that ability to give that you know, a little bit of the knowledge of here and the yeah. opportunity to have the land to yeah. use, you know, for growing food or farm. Exactly. And that was, I mean, that was like our, our research as much as it was putting things into practice. And, you know, I guess the real story besides the blood, sweat and tears that we put into business, build the infrastructure, was also experiencing the effects of, you know, our industrial food system. We wanted to grow for scale. You know, we, we wanted to really utilize all the resources and grow as much food as possible. But we ended up basically focusing on kind of um, quick turnaround crops like microgreens in controlled environments on the eastern plains. So we are a little bit of an anomaly, you know, but we just see the benefits of greenhouse production. It's best specifically in our region where we receive over 300 days of sunshine. And, um, you know, we really wanted to use that as a, um, as a resource, the sunlight. And that's why we chose to grow in this greenhouse, uh, which is a passive solar design that um, only allows light through the south end, um, south side of the, of the building. And the rest of the other three walls are insulated to retain that heat. And it's built for winter growing so that we can grow it year round and be a, a source of food security. And so that really helped us um, increase our production to meet the volume needs of our grocery stores. We thought that was like a safe ground to be on until we received a bankruptcy letter from one of our partners. Oh no. At that time, we were um, past due quite a bit of money to start off the year in 2020. And, um, and that really kind of like uh, hindered our, our movement forward. And then we all know COVID hit and shut down our restaurants. So it was a, a, an uncertain time uh, for us. 
So during that time, then were you then? I mean, in terms of any business pivots, were you then starting to do more focus on direct to consumer, or you know, kind of how did you kind of mitigate those bumps? So at the beginning, we were working with our grocery stores still, and everything was kind of we we're surviving along the way, and uh, basically that kind of slowly, as some of the independent grocery stores shut down, uh, that basically slowly just took away our clients. So yeah, that. Basically, the beginning of that year or basically, or in the fall of the previous year, we started working with High Plains Food Co-op packing mm -hmm. their boxes or their direct-to-consumer oh, yeah. packaging. So we were already working in kind of a direction where we were, you know, helping other organizations with what we were doing at Emerald Gardens. And that kind of really helped set the uh, model. Yeah, you know? start everything for yeah. what we found the next step stage yeah. would be. It was, uh, you know, it was very, um, in hindsight, you know, we didn't really know that COVID was going to hit, but we knew that we wanted to address distribution and we needed to find a way that, um, that a model for distribution could actually support farmers like us and other small, mid-sized farmers as well, so that we didn't always rely on direct to consumer channels, but could be kind of collectively incorporated into larger supply chains. And so when, when COVID hit and we had to pivot, we had already kind of tinkered in how to do that. So it paved the way for us to pivot in a very rapid manner. And thankfully, you know, we had good values in place from the very beginning, not just for stewards of our land, but also stewards of our community. And I started working with food pantries and food access organizations who eventually came to us when they received federal funding to supplement um, the donation of food that they were receiving. I mean, at that time, donations went down and so they needed to supplement. But we were the only people in their network that they knew directly as farmers and who had food in the middle of winter. So, you know, we, we really kind of supported our mutual ends in that, in that way. But then we realized we couldn't just give them microgreens and salad greens. There were other products that we could also offer, and that's when we reached out to High Plains and our community of farmers to aggregate, distribute, meet the immediate need in food insecurity, and ensure the viability of our local farms. And as COVID started to surface all of these problems, we realized they were there from the very beginning. And now that we could clearly see the challenges, we, could, we can innovate solutions to meet those head on. I want to hear about uh, just your model of learning. I mean, because as, as, as farmers that are coming into the space, I remember this like, when I was a first-time producer. The more I learned, the more I realized how little I knew. So I'm curious, like, Roberto and Dave, like, how have you guys gone about basically flattening the, the, the learning curve? I mean, whether it's like understanding your market, knowing which direction to go into, even, even your passive solar greenhouse, what was, I mean, how did you learn about all that and then implement it in a way that, that made sense for the context of your market? Yeah, I think we dive in head first. <laughs> yeah, we just <laughs> We're not afraid to take the leaps. And and I think we, we leverage our strengths. You that's know? a part of the reason that we're still around is because we keep going after those new opportunities, which are yeah. really going to help us. But yeah, the, even in the basic sense of learning how to do a greenhouse in this way and stuff like that, I think yeah. we both have just an interest in going after new knowledge that we want to learn about and obviously we research it pretty deeply yeah i think we're just naturally curious and that curiosity um allows us to engage in a project with passion and commitment to see it through and like i said neither you know dave and and i are first generation farmers trying to do something different but because of that we bring a different approach a different awareness um you know we're both creative and so that allows us to explore different dimensions of a particular situation to come up with the best way to address it, whether it's actual material, infrastructure, production, operations, workflow, or whether it's surveying the landscape of agriculture, markets, um, the front range context to really understand how things connect. And, um, and like I said, you know, Dave is really able to kind of ground a lot of the ideas and actually manifest them. And I'm much more 
you know, I like to spend my time in the cloud sometime looking at opportunities and intersections. And so when those things combine, that's when models actually manifest. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, that's a great transition then into what, what uh, East Denver Food Hub is. So for those that uh, are, are just getting to, to know what, what, uh, what that organization is and the community you serve, um, can you take a few minutes and just uh, make the introduction for us? Sure. Well, yeah, like, I don't know, like what we were talking about with the boxes, basically that slowly, we were, East, we were still Emerald Gardens doing those boxes for uh, WIC, Women, Infant, Children, and a few other small organizations. I think we were only doing like 50 to 60 boxes then, like a week. And that would kind of moved into our connection, what Roberto was talking about, into our local farmers that we were working with and trying to help them out with their sales of their products. So we kind of, in that packing of those boxes, we realized that, you know, distribution of what we were doing was a little bit different than just farming. So it's like we were trying to say we're helping out all of those farmers and we realized that was something different. And that's where East End Food Come came into play and yeah. Roberto would continue on. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately East Denver Food Hub is an organization that connects local farmers to local and regional markets by offering aggregation, distribution, and marketing um, services. But as much as it is a business in the context of selling food, it is also a kind of um, living laboratory where we try things, but it also feeds back into us. So when, for example, we started to see changes in the food access space, now we started to see them as markets. And for the first time, food pantries became a viable market for farmers. And out of that, we started to understand, you know, how people were looking at food access and what the important role local procurement or purchasing from your local farmers can have in developing equitable and sustainable local food economies and local food systems. And so that has really informed our experience and our awareness that we can now take to conversations at the local, state, and regional level about what is the future of the local food economy? How do we make advances in mitigating the challenges caused by COVID, but also building a long-term plan that can sustain our local agriculture. And for us, it really revolves around the social relationships that we build in and around food and the values that we want to see in our food system. And ultimately, you know, COVID made the invisible visible. And now we're starting to see the important role that agricultural labor plays, right? Um, oftentimes we go to the grocery store, we just see a tomato, we see a banana, or we see, you know, some salad greens but we don't see the stories of the people that grow that food. We don't see the story of the land that supports that production or how the, the intermediary agents, the food chain workers are treated and what they experience to ultimately bring that food to our table and to our families. And so for us, that storytelling is so important because it is able again to bring visibility to the things that we don't see when we go to the grocery store. And so that social relationship piece informs everything that we do. And we're really trying to promote a food system where farmers are valued, where land is honored, where animals are protected, and where everybody has enough to eat. You know, before we hop on to the, the interview here, I was um, um, just going over the, the East Denver Food Hub website and uh, was just really enjoying just the, the, the range of um, work that you're doing across, you know, what you, how you mentioned here. You know, specifically, I'm looking at the Mellow Market and, and just how that's all converging. So I think that's part of the storytelling that, that you referenced there, Roberto. It is. Yeah. And the website needs, a, uh, needs some TLC. So, you know, we've, we've been so busy working and moving things on the ground that we've kind of neglected our presentation. So our reputation and our work, I think, needs to be reflected in, in our marketing materials and our language. And that's what we'll be focusing on now. So we'll be updating that soon. But yeah, the, the market is another, you know, we, I guess just to set the context, we view our work as an ecosystem and our business practices as an ecosystem. So 
um, as much as we're diversifying, we also want to be aware that everything that we do flows back to the main kind of well-being of all of our projects, all of our people, our components, and the different enterprises that we're kind of um, looking at. So the Montbello market really grew out of a need to provide a space where local producers and entrepreneurs in our community of Montbello, which is doesn't have a lot of resources or a lot of opportunities, where it could be community rooted and led and be a space for the makers and producers to interface with customers. We realized, you know, we have the East Denver Food Hub has a 15,000 square foot warehouse facility um, closer to Denver that we want to utilize for uh, the purposes of serving our communities. And so, you know, we we realized too that that um, had the added benefit of, again, spreading the word about what we do, engaging people, building relationships. And so um, the Montbello Market is now a project that is being um, kind of overseen by you know, our team, our community, and specifically by the community there. So that Dave and I can offer that, but not necessarily be the ones to run it, you know. Uh, we know when to, when to step forward and when to step back so that others can step forward. That's great. So I was uh, going over your Instagram page uh, a few days back and, and uh, certainly uh, you, uh, 2021 was not a boring year for you guys. I can tell you that, right, right for a fact that <laughs> you had a lot in the mix. One, one of your posts I, I caught my attention in particular, uh, mention of East Denver Media Hub. Tell me more about that, guys. I mean, yeah, really the East Denver Media Hub kind of all came about when uh, Ron came into our lives. And Ron, Ron Washington, yeah. Yeah, Ron Washington. And he basically was helping us take pictures of what we were building. And he was there from the beginning and really kind of like documented. Yeah, documented us starting the East Denver Food Hub and how we worked with the community and how we were working with the farms and getting that to the final destinations and serving the community and basically it was it, it basically came out of all that video that he got and was editing together to figure out how to make it something that we can use yeah. and basically that work kind of worked into these vendor media hub kind of thing so yeah yeah i mean ron um, you know, called me up one day and he said he was a filmmaker that he wanted to come see the farm. I was like, great, this could be a good opportunity. And, uh, you know, I met him and he just had so much passion for the moving image and for video and media and um, was just getting started in his ad adventures in understanding farming. Um, he was a, you know, one of the only black entrepreneurs that really came to our farm. And then he told me that he was living close by too in this area that isn't very diverse, you know? So that was a really important thing for me too, to just understand that, you know, where there's, there's more um, people of color coming to the Eastern Plains. And so, you know, we, we kind of um, really connected on that, um, that important role of, of really building our community and, and making sure that we advance, um, you know, a, a lens of, racial equity in everything that we do. So he was here almost every day, just documenting our experience of COVID, our pivot. And, you know, he was the one that really reignited in us, um, again, our passion for media and storytelling and communications and leveraging um, what Dave and I studied from our youth. So, you know, he really took it on and I saw an opportunity to develop the East Denver Media Hub as a way to continue the coverage. But then again, seeing it as an opportunity to provide other people in the community access to the tools of communication so that they can amplify their voice and potentially reach um, the table where decisions are made, where legislation is written um, that can be conducive to the world that we want to see. Yeah, and that's really working into something that hopefully we'll be able to help others use the space the same way that we're yeah. working with Ron. So. Exactly. That's exciting, guys. I mean, I, I cannot wait to uh, just see that evolve and the impact that, that you all create with uh, with that part of your enterprise. Yeah, 
uh, I mean, we're excited and it's, it, it gives us an opportunity to look at our work in different ways as well. And the work, look at other people's work and how yeah. they're doing it. So that was the great opportunity yeah. with that first project that we had with them yeah. the hub was to... Exactly. And now we, I mean, it's, it's undeniable the, the important role that media communications and marketing plays in, in the successful business. Like everybody has to be a filmmaker. Everybody has to be uh, some kind of practitioner in the arts and the media to be able to communicate your vision, to reach your audience and to um, build a solid foundation for your business. So, you know, we can't, we can't just pretend that producing products is going to make it a successful organization or enterprise. You have to engage with people. You have to tell your story. You have to hit those emotional registers so that your customers aren't just people purchasing food. They are, you know, your, your allies, they're your community. And again, returning to that, um, that relationships piece that is so important. Sometimes I joke that, you know, we understand what happens beneath the soil, the soil food web, the symbiotic relationships between mycorrhizae, bacteria, fungi, and how nutrients move. There is an intelligence there. And, you know, I would love to surface that. What does it look like to have a social food web? How can food hubs be mycelial nodes that transmit information and nutrients back to the community? So that's kind of, again, the creative look that we bring and that we really want to imbue our work with. Uh, sounds like a blast, guys. Uh, again, like, I think it's going to be a, a great, great effort and, and project to see unfold. Roberto, I, certainly you are among that ne next generation of leaders within the Latinx food and ag scene. So I wanted to you know, devote some time of uh, what are some of the important topics within um, that like, who's so has been so vital, both historically and in the present world, with our ag and food systems. Sure, yeah. Uh, this is a really important question. And, you know, I'm somebody that likes to contextualize um, the challenges and the problems. And so for me, you know, agriculture, like we take it back to the roots. You know, what's the history of agriculture in the United States? And ultimately, you know, it's rooted in stolen land and forced labor. And that continues to express itself in a myriad of ways in our contemporary moments. Um, lack of access to land, lack of access to resources, economic opportunities, Again, you know, it's um, the devaluing of labor for mass production of food. And so the main people that have been a part of that have mostly been uh, Latinx immigrants who have been so closely tied to agriculture in the United States. Last year, we did a major push to uh, bring a bill into existence um, that addressed agricultural workers' rights so that immigrant farm workers now have access to social services, uh, continuous rest breaks, access to fresh water, the um, opportunity to collective bargain. And as you know, essential workers, we've been deemed in this period of COVID, um, its history has revealed that agricultural workers are still considered um, you know, dispensable. And so now highlighting the critical role that we play, not just agricultural workers, all workers that bring food to our communities. The farms. The, the farms, yeah. We need to highlight them as the cornerstone of community, as the frontline warriors that um, help us survive and mitigate this, this opportunity. So, you know, when I'm engaging in conversation, I bring that awareness to, um, to the table and... It's important that you know we we see um, this transition of the farm worker to a farm owner, and for me, you know, it's exemplified in uh, sugar moon mushrooms. So uh, when we started to gain these contracts and cash flow started to improve, uh, we wanted to launch a mushroom operation, and we came in contact with a young man. Uh, who's a DACA dreamer and an avid mycologist, an aspiring mushroom farmer, who basically presented us with a budget and a business plan. And we're like, let's see how we can make this work. And so we started to connect the dots and we got a local benefactor to um, 
to basically support us with some seed money in the beginning. And, uh, and then Dave and I kind of figured out how to make uh, a mushroom production facility out of two shipping containers. We love shipping wow. containers <laughs> yeah. and they serve multiple purposes here on the farm. But that's how we were able to, you know, really practice our values of cooperative and collective efforts to support people that have been extremely um, kind of excluded from engaging in agriculture. And so it's a small, you know, step towards what we eventually want to see at scale. But we're learning so much in terms of the value that that can bring, why it's important to our ecosystem, um, you know, the the resonance between this kind of collective practice of different farms on the same land that are all connected by the food hub. And so we're just building this model and sharing it and connecting with others uh, in the same way. That's great. You know, I, I have a couple of remaining questions for you guys. One, I want to hear from you both. Like in the near future, what excites you most about uh, what you're doing with East Denver Food Hub? What should we expect from the, the East Denver Food Hub family of companies in the near future? Really, I just get excited about the, the ability for us to communicate and have multiple organizations work together. And it's not all about just the talking, but actually making the action and making the action happen with the timing of what is happening in the market and yeah. what is happening in the industry at the time. So that's, and working with new farms that, you know, there's a lot of farmers out here or small time farmers that just farm for themselves, but they have excess and they want to get rid of and really the connection of them to East Denver Food Hub to a larger market where they can actually maybe use that as a source of income rather than just a source to feed their family. And really making Working. those connections is what really excites me. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited a lot about a lot of things, I would say. Definitely echo everything Dave mentioned. Um, you know, for me, it, it really is about scaling a local food supply chain, building a hub to hub network. And one of our partners, Farm Fair, uses this term um, or this you know, motto, we want to build economies of collaboration to compete with the economies of scale. And I see so much promise in that, so much resilience, uh, potentially to buffer future catastrophes or environmental and health related um, challenges. And so you know, we're, we're trying to really grow that, that vision and share it with people and gain more, more partners um, I'm really interested, too, in this developing market uh, for institutions, hospitals and schools, purchasing local food, food pantries, purchasing local food. You know, they, they're they receiving a lot of funding. There's a lot of opportunities on the horizon, both federally and in our state, to support, again, the links between local agriculture and local institutions but the purchasing power that they all have collectively on a national level is huge. And I just imagine what that can do to our, to our local economy and our agriculture scene. But you know, it, it does take a little bit of policy. It does take a little bit of uh, ingenuity and relationship building and stewarding people across um, to a different paradigm, to a sense of possibility and um, and to showcase that I think is going to require, um, you know, media, communications, pilots and projects. And so, you know, as much as we're excited to engage in these new market channels and developing ways of using um, their community benefit dollars and commitments to purchase food, um, create partnerships, perhaps um, create farms on unused land that that belong to hospitals to build that resilience and to showcase innovative agricultural practices and sustainability, the intersections of community wealth building, health and uh, food resilience. It's, it's an exciting time and people have felt vulnerable um, due to the way that we've been doing things. Everybody has felt it at some point or another during this time. And that's really opened up a lot of hearts and a lot of minds to try different things, to innovate partnerships. And so, you know, I'm really interested in, in just supporting that 
and uh, growing it and cultivating that sense that we all have and and documenting it using the media hub and making sure that we're telling our own stories. Where do you want folks to go to online to stay in, in close touch with, with what you're doing across all these uh, different uh, projects that you're involved in? Yeah, I mean, really keep in touch with us doing exactly what we're doing. We're trying to get that on Instagram a lot. And then, but if you go to our website, uh, we're doing a uh, overhaul right now, but our website, you can always support us by just buying the food from local farmers. And it's really, it's just a, all the way up and down the supply chain because you're getting food directly from your local area. So. Yeah, yeah. You could go to um, www.eastdenverfoodhub.com or on Instagram at East Denver Food Hub. Um, our farms um, at Sugar Moon Mushrooms or EG Microgreens is our Instagram, and our farm website is emeraldgardens.farm. Um, but yeah, you know, we'd love to connect with people. Uh, reach out to us, regardless of whether or not you're in Colorado. Uh, we want to continue this conversation. And there's a lot more that um, that we can share and learn from one another. So the invitation is to really build a, a community of like-minded, values-aligned people, whether or not you're in farming. You know, partnerships are so critical to any business venture. And um, building that is kind of like the, the main purpose, almost, of what we're trying to do. So if you're in Colorado, definitely come out to the Food Hub, come visit our farms, um, get to know our other farmers in the network, and let's build, let's build this food system together. Roberto, Dave, thank you. I've uh, been grateful for what you and your team are building and excited to watch your impact continue to grow in the future. Thanks so much, Don. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.